Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Jewish Museum. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the manager of public programs. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, Dialogue and Discourse, Martha Rossler and Darcy Alexander. This talk is held in conjunction with the exhibition Martha Rossler Irrespective on view in our first floor gallery space until March 3rd. So if you didn't have a chance to visit the galleries tonight, please come back and do so. There will be a number of related talks, workshops, and performances coming up in 2019. So for full details on all of those events, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. Now to introduce tonight's speakers. Darcy Alexander is the Susan and Elihu Rose Chief Curator at the Jewish Museum. Previously, she held positions at the Walker Art Center, Baltimore Museum of Art, and the Museum of Modern Art. Most recently, she served as the Executive Director of the Katona Museum of Art in Westchester County. Alexander has curated numerous exhibitions focusing on post-war American and European art, notably International Pop, The Spectacular of Vernacular, Franz West, To Build a House, You Start with the Roof, Work 1972 to 2008, and Slideshow. Martha Rossler was born in Brooklyn, where she continues to live and work. She attended Brooklyn College of the City University of New York and the University of California, San Diego, where she received her BFA and MFA, respectively. Her work across video, photography, text, installation, and performance focuses on the public sphere, exploring issues from everyday life and the media to architecture and the built environment, especially as they affect women. She has had exhibitions at numerous institutions internationally and in the US, including the Museum of Modern Art, Kunstmuseum Basel, the Seattle Museum of Art, and the Centre Pompidou. Rossler has published numerous books of photography, art, and writing, and her work can be found in publications such as Art Forum, Eflux Journal, and Texer Kunst. She received the Guggenheim Museum Lifetime Achievement Award in 2010. Now, if I could ask you to please take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Martha Rossler and Darcy Alexander. Good evening. Hello, Martha. Hi, Darcy. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> um, so the format of our conversation tonight, I thought, would be going back and forth between some slides and some questions. And um, thinking about how I would open our conversation tonight, I guess it makes the most sense to kind of go back to your early history. So we're going we're gonna to do um, a little, little conversation about where you got started. And as I understand it, you really got started during the 1960s when there was so much political and social unrest, particularly Vietnam. And I'm wondering how the circumstances of the world at that time motivated you to make the work that you did. And um, reflecting back on it, what, you know, what that time meant for you as an artist. Oh, first we have to step back a little bit and say I was an abstract expressionist painting student. Um, but uh, it became plain that the it took a decade or so for me to decide I had to give up painting and stop doing the other things that I was doing in response to um, the um, astonishing and highly motivating, frightening, dangerous, wonderful, and um, even life-threatening events of the 60s. Mm -hmm. By life-threatening, I'm thinking, among other things, not only of the Cold War and nuclear threats, but of course of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so uh, the initial um, motivation I had to move toward political work uh, came from 
being engaged in various political movements, starting with a very small engagement with the civil rights movement when I was still in high school and then college, um, but not in any direct way. Um, that is not marching, though I did go to the March on Washington in 1963 with a group of friends. And um, uh, what really gave me a kick uh, to start thinking about representation uh, was the proliferation of bizarre uh, commodifying, infantil infantilizing images of women that were everywhere and that were um, intending to say, in effect, that women not only were beautiful and alluring, they were beautiful and alluring because they looked like babies and little girls. It was very popular in the 60s. And um, there was an undercurrent of feminism avant la lettre. Uh, the f there was feminism in Europe. It hadn't quite made its way to the US, but there was a lot of unrest on women's part. And I was just at the right moment when that actually blossomed into a movement in the late 60s. Simultaneously, I was activist, an act, I was active in the anti-war protests and demonstrations and movements and strategizing of the 60s. And I decided that I needed to actually make comprehensible work about those two interests even while I kept on painting. I was also taking photographs, straightforward street photography, let's call it, because I believed that uh, all abstract painters took photographs because everyone had a will toward narrativity and representation. So. So looking at these two images that we have on the screen, these started as handouts of sorts, right? When you these began did. the Bringing the War Home series. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I was making images of women, and I was startled to see a really riveting photograph of a young Vietnamese woman with children uh, who appeared to be swimming across a river, which was on the cover of, I think, the New York Post, then a liberal newspaper, on my mother's dining room table. And it occurred to me that I could take the same form of photo montage that I was using to represent women and make anti-war flyers because the flyers that we got were insane. They were completely covered with text, which either looked like it was just straight translation from a foreign language, um, or written by a person who needed help. There were no margins. It was just the kind of uh, grammatical help. What? Grammatical help. No, or not grammatical. Kind of help. Medical help. <laughs> <laughs> tin foil hat, um, a kind of paranoid um, ravings that we may no longer be familiar with except from the White House, whatever. Um, we'll get to that. And I thought, I'm going to make flyers without any words. They're not going to tell you to do anything. They're going to show you why you should care. And it didn't occur to me to hand them out just anywhere. I handed them out at gatherings, and um, there were a lot of gatherings in the 60s of various sorts, and on marches themselves, but I couldn't afford to print them. It never even occurred to me, but my father, who was a lawyer, had discovered the Xerox machine. And he was enthralled and captivated by the possibilities of not having to type seven carbon copies of something. So I just went to the local store. And actually, there were color Xeroxes even then, but I couldn't have afforded them, so they were all just 
black and white Xeroxes, and if they were the wrong size, whatever size they came out to be was fine, you know, and that's what I did. It's looking at this series, the Bringing the War Home series, and thinking about hard, it's, it's hard hitting. I mean, you and I have walked through the exhibition and you've talked me through all of the source material from the, the photographs that you've collaged together. And then we go to images like this one from Body Beautiful, which I have to admit, I kind of had a chuckle when I saw this because it's, uh, first of all, the, you know, the, configuration of this woman's breast on an oven and like the notion of femininity and ovens and hotness and all of those ideas that get conjured I think that looking one's at called this hot meat it's called hot meat that's right <laughs> um but humor operates in some of these works too a bit doesn't it I mean in in particularly in this in the Body Beautiful series, where you have really bizarre combinations of female body parts floating across advertisements or reconfigured in aw awkward ways, um, I wonder if you could if you could speak to that, or maybe it wasn't intended at all, and it was. You know. Well, of course, they are grotesque, absurd, and therefore funny. And um, but can I say dark humor? It's not. Mm -hmm. I'm standing with the woman, not against her. I would also say that uh, works like this sort of came late in my working with women's images, which tended more toward, toward the full advertisement or other full body things, because um, one of the things that annoys me most about uh, representations of women in advertising, and I actually eventually gave a long talk about this, was that women are always presented as pieces, body parts, fragment, fragmenty, fragment, fragmented, wow, it's bad with me, sorry. Fragmentary elements um, that, of course, don't have the power of will because a piece of meat is not an operative human being. And I was very interested to see that one did not find men represented that way and largely still don't as a set of parts or just isolated parts. So I think in particular, photography allows the presentation of the female body as isolated parts. So eventually I did ones using body parts, including one um, called wallpaper that's a series of body parts on a kind of a faux wood background. But almost all of the images come out of Playboy, which I used to find in the um, garbage room, uh, actually the incinerator room, if anyone knows what that was, um, of the apartment building I was living in. Um, I used the same strategy for both these and the anti-war works, which is to put together the image of a figure, a person, with a setting that would not normally have that image enclosed within it and suggest that it was a rational space. Even the stove is a rational space. It's an object with a picture within it, um, which was probably even more jarring and funny back then when we didn't have pictures on things, so at least not that kind. So you eventually went back and were inspired to revisit that early Bringing the War Home series, and I love this one because it's it's about war and femininity in the domestic space, but it's also about selfie culture. Um, and I'm just wondering what, if you could speak to why you decided to revisit something from earlier in your life and um, a little bit about, maybe you can decode this, uh, this picture a little bit because it may be a little hard to see um, from the audience what, what elements um, are, are composited here together in the, in the image. Okay. Um, it's from about this one's from 2008, four. four. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they came in two groups, 2004 and 2008. 
So there was no selfie culture, I have to say that. The word wasn't invented until a few years back. And the reason it, of course, looking at it now, that's what it screams. But in fact, she's looking at, um, so I'm gonna start with the smallest detail. Um, these twins or doppelgangers, whatever, uh, are looking at the faces of um, uh, Middle Eastern or Afghan men in gestures of shock and grief. Um, and it's an image from Motorola, which was a popular flip phone of the time. And it's got two young girls from different scenes, neither of whom is dead, I have to say. They are both wounded and a, um, a lovely living room with lovely um, depersonalized decor and a war scene outside. So what I've put together there, of course, is a setting which would be the setting perhaps for the woman with the phones, but not for anything else. And the series, which had no title, eventually was called House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home. The idea being that we think it's over there, but it's a, as much over here as over there, and that you can't get away with disclaiming our relationship to what our government is doing by simply claiming that we have different entitlements, different lives, and different concerns. Uh, I returned to the series, which I had done 30 years earlier, that is this method of working, um, because I was part of an activist group called Artists Against the War, which um, spent several years doing anti-war work and everybody in the group was a better graphic designer than I was and also had more time to devote to the uh, actual production and planning. And I felt I owed it to myself to do something in my own voice and to feel as though really I was not just part of a group, but not that I have anything against being part of a group, but I wanted to actually feel as though I made myself heard. I had a few other more ulterior motives, which was that this was around the time that the original series um, from the 60s and early 70s was appearing in art venues, which I hadn't permitted them to be earlier and they were being admired. I didn't want them to be admired because aesthetic admiration is the same, sorry, as depoliticization. And I wanted to make sure people understood that the politics that's clear in these works was the same clear politics back then. And if you respond to these, you need to understand what you're responding to in the others. Um, and I expected two things. One is that people would say, can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I was hoping I would be uh, castigated with that because I had an answer, which is we haven't learned anything from Vietnam. We are in the same quagmire that was being decried then. And in fact, people did say it to me, so. Um, and um, people objected to the politics. And my answer was, it's the same politics, you know. Uh, but at that point, your career had made a huge leap. I mean, you said uh, that, in fact, by the time you were making this second series, you, it, these works were being situated within the art world context, and even some of your earlier pieces from the 60s were being collected by museums at this point as well. So how did that resonate with you? I mean, you said you, you have this, uh, in a way, you're, you're articulating a, an extreme discomfort for conversations around aesthetics, but your work was being incorporated into that context more and more, and here you have an art, you know. And I, I'm just wondering, how, how, does, how do you feel about um, 
the placement and the discourse around your, your work in an art context now? Well, you said my career had taken a huge leap. I didn't have a career because if there was one word that artists would never have used about their work, it would be career. That was taboo. Um, we didn't claim to have anything. We claimed to be artists and to make art. And uh, I can say, I'm so old that, that that was my milieu. It was kind of the tail end of the avant-garde. And um, I took it very seriously. I objected a little when a friend said, you know, referred to non-artists as civilians. Like, wait, what? Um, by which she meant that they weren't working 24-7, whereas artists did, which I had to agree with. It's a different way of thinking about what it is you do. People with careers go to work. We're always at work. So that sounds ridiculous, but that's the way artists, they, we still think that way. Um, I became part of, uh, when I was in grad school, um, in San Diego, far from deepest Brooklyn, uh, I was part of a group that spent a lot of time talking about what did we want from our work. They were primarily photographers, and it was everything you could think of, which was, uh, and I say this with humor and humility, we thought we could change the world, and why not? The 60s changed the world. Why couldn't we change the art world? So we thought um, basically about renovating the critique of and practice of documentary photography, which was really important to all of us, but why should we abandon the art world, which all my work before that had been outside the art world, because I didn't expect the gatekeepers to allow me in, which they wouldn't have, but it didn't bother me. So. Um, Sorry about the career comment. Uh, <laughs> it's actually very useful. <laughs> I, I knew she you just latched right onto that, and there you were off. So. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, uh, I, I, I get well, it. Well, um, you know, we need occasionally to be reminded that what we think we know about the origins of people's work or the past or what artists thought or what anyone thought, feminists, for example, is perhaps different from our backward extrapolation that there was another starting point, another way of thinking, another way of working. Um, we, uh, right there in the early 70s, didn't expect to enter the art world, but we did hope to transform it, which in some respects, I will say, some of us did, and certainly, the advent of practices like conceptual art were very helpful because they moved away from a discourse of uh, the transcendent and the sublime uh, that happened already slightly before with the collapse of abstract expressionism, the rise of minimalism, which had a slogan, what you see is what you see, uh, which is, you know, a little nihilistic. So this is a good, um, a good jumping off point for your own version of a minimalist grid. Right. Um, which is your diaper pattern, where you're using your son's diapers and... You used diapers. You, washed you, okay. used diapers. <laughs> your used, your, your son's, not your used son, <laughs> but your <laughs> son's <laughs> used He's diapers. Used. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you, can you give us a little bit of background on this piece? This is, um, I did a lot of work using clothing, um, as you may discover, and um, partly because of its relationship to women's lives, of course. I did a work called Some Women Prisoners of the Chiu Regime in the infamous Pulo Condori Prison in South Vietnam. It was part of my effort to say to people, in your disidentification with uh, little Asians in black pajamas, please think again. So I used women's clothing with the names and dates of birth and 
prisoner numbers uh, of South Vietnamese women prisoners. Um, in this case, I put phrases relating to the war in Vietnam in which in almost every little phrase on one of the diapers, the Vietnamese are referred to as gooks, which is a racial slur, one that John McCain used even in his campaign for president. Um, it was part of the general myth that Asians don't have feelings, which General Westmoreland actually said, they don't feel things the same way we do, which is the most powerful method of telling the home population that they're not you, you don't need to worry about them, you don't need to feel for them, they're not as good as you, and they wouldn't even care because they don't, you know, they're just fatalistic. And so I, um, of course I had a child, and I wanted to invoke his bodily presence, but also only the trappings of being the mother of a living being, and then taking diapers which have been cleansed of that which can be replaced by the word gook, which is a form of excrement, that is the excrement and this, these racial slurs are kind of the analogous elements. Well, that, that brings to mind just the, you know, the Bowery, which is one of the um, great um, pieces in the exhibition and probably the one that I first knew about when I was learning about your work um, in graduate school. And it has, in a different way, the same um, sort of tactic of making a subject kind of disappear. In this case, um, there are no visible human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and yet this body of work <laughs> is very much about a population of people. <coughs> We're only seeing two um, images out of a much larger composition, but um, this has become such a, you know, such a touchstone for so many students and artists, and um, particularly those who are interested in the critique of images. And it's now, you know, decades old. It's a piece that's, you know, it's it continues to retain its relevance, but kind of looking back on this piece now and looking at it from the perspective of both where you've come personally, but you know, also how that area of the city has changed. I wonder if you can make any reflections on the Bowery from the well, perspective of now. So it's a little hard to disentangle what the Bowery is about now because the Bowery as a place has been fully gentrified. Um, but this is a work about photography. Uh, it's photographs of sites along the Bowery, which is pretty much the whole stretch from um, below Canal to just about up to Houston, I guess. Uh, maybe only as far as Cooper Square, yeah. Um, which is the other street. But it was a section in the mid 70s when I photographed it of a New York City in deep decline and fiscal crisis. So the Bowery itself, which was the home for transient men who lived in the single room occupancy hotels along it and who hung out on the streets and in the bars, was itself somewhat derelict. The Bowery for a long time was the Skid Row of New York, even though oddly that's a term from Seattle. Um, but it wasn't a work about homelessness and it wasn't a work about despair or about the population there so much as about the representation of it by people who made it their life business to take pictures of people in distress for a purpose that had long lost its force, which was the humanist gospel 
that these are people who need our help. That was important in the early days of social documentary, but it had become more a form of trophy hunting with a camera, which I and my friends found deeply troubling. Um, but you talked a little bit earlier about the humor in my work, which is often so dry, it's almost unrecoverable. Um, I thought with the diapers that rhyming shit and gooks would be mostly unrecoverable by a lot of people because I, I often feel like in some of my videos, including semiotics of the kitchen, I need to be there and laugh so that people understand you can laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Bowery to me came almost completely straight out of pop art and Ed Ruscha, who did every, I never remember the name of it, every building, building on, on Sunset, Sunset, Sunset Strip, Strip right. and other things that were like representations of the city in a distanced way that didn't have to do with either architecture or humanism. So I was walking down the Bowery one day, as I did every day, and I had this idea that I would extract the subject because I really had no intention of pointing my camera at people who are out on the street because that's the only place that can really be. And just showing the setting, because that's what photography can do, metonymy. And to supplement it with a series of poeticized, metaphorized words relating to the state of drunkenness, which both represent and drunks represents the people there but also us this is a common vocabulary we all know what many though certainly not all of the words on the wall mean and i hung it in a grid which is the conceptual art way just like the diapers or carl andre's floor pieces or many other conceptual art pieces and I put the title at the end, and the title is The Bowery and Two Inadequate Descriptive Systems, because in fact, we need to remember that no representation fully maps the experience of life, of anything. Just to remind people that this is about a system of representation, in fact, two of them together. So, you can say that this work is overly arcane and overly ambitious. You can say whatever you want about it, but that's what I was thinking. And it was the first work that I made that was intended to be hung in a gallery or in a museum on the wall with other documentary photographs because it was a work of dialogue. It was saying, look over there at those works and look over here at this and what the hell is this bizarre, grotesque creature doing in a room with humanist photographs? So, um, you can see I can produce a book about it. Okay, so this is thing. a perfect segue. So language <laughs> is part of your inadequate descriptive systems. Um, text has always been a huge uh, <laughs> motivator. <laughs> Talk about me, not you. Um, and you've recently, so we're jumping way ahead to the picture on the right, if it's not from this year, it's probably from the past couple of years. This is from um, this off year. Off the shelves, 2018. Which is from your library of 9,000 mm -hmm. books, at least. I've okay. seen it in person. And then the image on the right is a library installation drawn from your collection. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering if you can talk about off the shelf and its connection to early pieces like the Bowery. I mean, you're, you're, you're using language here within the framework of how knowledge is passed through text. Um, and you've ordered this series by sort of clustered by themes, like there's one on slavery, there's one on colonialism. So talk to us a little bit about- There's one on oh. gardening, there's one on female science fiction, one on male science fiction, okay. one on women. I just- There are many. How many total in this series? 15? I'm not sure. Okay. 13? 
not, I'm not so sure. So maybe tell us about. So I made four in 2010, or and then um, made a whole bunch more in 2018. Um, uh, I was a little bit startled by the way you talked about it, which is really interesting. Um, so the traveling library was the brilliant suggestion of somebody who said, stop complaining about all the books clogging your house. I've just been to Donald Judd's library. You can't touch a single book. Uh, and they're all in plastic slip cases. And uh, why not just bring all your books down to the gallery and we'll make a show. And then it traveled. And that was about 20, 2005. I'm not sure anymore. It went to a number of cities in Europe. and. Uh, we brought it back to the U.S. Um, the Off the Shelf is a, a disembodied set of spines and a few covers of books from various categories, some of which fit the category squarely, and others of which are a strange relationship to the category. Um, to and here's where I think I'm hooking into what you were saying, that for book fetishists like myself, I also am quite cognizant of the fact that books are one form of encoding, incorporating, and uh, enfolding knowledge and information, which appears in many other forms. These are digital images of spines and fronts. I, you know, I said that already, but when I say they're digital, they are not pictures of books, and there's nothing behind them. There's no physical dimensionality to these images. The, the spines can sit right on top of one another. To point out that, yes, books are beautiful, but they also are of a moment. But don't forget, books are beautiful not to mention what's in them, because they are organized according to the various taxonomies of knowledge that we've put together. Thank you. OK, so um, this is an installation shot from downstairs. And it's part of the installation for Gourmet Experience, which is sort of a key work in an ongoing interest that you have in food and cuisine and cooking and all of the associations of those activities to female labor, mm -hmm. um, to themes of consumption, mm -hmm. uh, both consumption of food but a consumption of goods. And this particular piece, The Gourmet Experience, has a really interesting story about its origin. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the first Gourmet Experience. And um, it was my thesis show. Is, is that what you were asking? <laughs> That's what I was asking. It was my thesis show. Um, but I made what I realized years later was um, a form of bait and switch, which I assumed that everyone whom I invited would know. I sent out engraved invitations to a gourmet experience at a certain hour in the gallery. And um, I didn't consider serving any food or drink. I thought that was obvious. <laughs> like, uh, no. Um, a poor student does not have, really, no. This was about, you know, the discourse and performance of the idea of gourmet cuisine. I, we basically don't use the word gourmet anymore. I think gourmet magazine doesn't even exist anymore. People are embarrassed by their food fatism and fetishism and so on, but they try to pretend it's not an elite occupation, which the word gour or uh, gourmet preoccupation, which the word I'm losing my mind. Um, so it was divided into courses, and I can't resist saying that if you go to the show, there's uh, another work called Global Taste, a meal in three courses, which also is only about pictures of food and the discourses that are uh, engaged by 
images of food, most of them the size of mountains, if you consider the screen to be a field. Um, and this was a moment in which colorful cookbooks were being produced because color printing at the turn of the 70s had taken a great leap forward into looking realistic and beautiful. So Time Life put out a series of cookbooks that were essentially travelogues with an, uh, an accompanying, accompanying recipe book, but essentially they were selling the idea of touring other countries on your belly. I guess that's a common thing, <laughs> through your belly. Um, this is a funny thing to say in a place with a Jewish restaurant in the basement because the idea of Jewish identity is often hung on the idea of bagels and locks, luckily. Um, but um, not for everyone, of course. I had, um, I was in grad school, I had lots of friends from other countries and I organized readings from French and um, English and other uh, narratives about the food experiences of people in those countries. So that's one thing that was served, but there were also photographs from the cookbooks and a dialogue between two people about what exactly does gourmetism represent and what about the producers, what about the consumers, what about hunger, you know, all the things that we now know really, really well but were not actually discussed and certainly not in relationship to becoming a gourmet at the time. So the giant leap forward that we've taken in terms of our understanding of the flow of commodities and the formation of identities uh, in both, both at home and abroad where we get our food and even the idea of local sourcing and you know, not expending uh, too much uh, deleterious gases in flying strawberries in from wherever. Um, all those things were not ever thought about really at the time, but that is, was the central focus of this work. Um, and uh, it, I also showed, uh, I had made, as I said, my work was not generally made for showing in a gallery, except our local gallery. I had done a series of postcard novels about women and food with a persona telling you her experience in relationship to cooking. The first one was, I want to be a gourmet. The second one was, what the hell am I doing unwrapping frozen hamburger patties in this stand? Let's make a revolution. And the third was based on interviews that I did with um, the local domestic workforce, which consisted in large part of women from Mexico. Uh, because I lived in San Diego. So that one was in Spanish. So there were three novels about women in, and their relationship to the production primarily, but also to some degree the consumption of food. Uh, so the, I made a video from the first one, and that also is part of the work, which is The Budding Gourmet. Okay, we're gonna go now to gross food. So this is airplane food. <laughs> And it, it is, I'm trying to figure out which was the economy cabin and which was the first class, but I think it's pretty obvious. So tell us when you started to take pictures of food and airplanes. Um, I have no idea. And why? Why did you start photographing your... Well, so I started uh, making work in airports when I became an itinerant artist. Before the 80s, people did not get on planes and go talk about their work or go have shows far away unless they were um, of advanced age and widely recognized persona. Um, in other words, you had to be a famous artist for someone to pay to drag you anywhere. But it became quite common in the 80s, and uh, I hadn't flown since I was three years old uh, because I couldn't afford it. I mean, nobody flew. I took the bus. Um, 
even to Chicago from San Diego. Don't do that. Um, so I thought two things. Why am I taking pictures? And what the hell is this? And years later, I figured out, um, oh, yeah, it's a postmodern world. This is a map of the world that we think we inhabit, which is based on nexuses and control uh, and uh, kind of placelessness. Things that we now also have become familiar with as ideas. I'm just but, flashing forward to some images oh, from, yeah, right. Um, spaces that both deceived you and controlled you and infantilized you and reassured you um, whatever could be done to squeeze human bodies into an, an aluminum cigar at 35,000 feet <laughs> without having people panic, revolt, or whatever it was, or get out of their respective classes, which I, you know, I used to wonder, they're marching us past the first class people, aren't they worried? <laughs> <laughs> no, because everyone knows how to behave. Um, but I do want to say that in German, economy classes holds klasse, which means wood class. <laughs> which, <laughs> so I also, at the later end of this, um, started taking pictures of the food on the tray. It's um, partly because it was very rude to take pictures for most of the time I've been alive, and then it became completely normalized, and you did not look like a complete maniac, though I think actually you still do. If you're taking a picture of the food on your tray in an airplane, though now mostly there is none. Um, I'm sorry, this has been bothering me all along, so if I seem like there's a bug on my cheek. <laughs> it's taped to my cheek. Um, uh, I'm having flashback to braces or something. That's <laughs> some kind of appendage here. Sorry, I'm not a good performer. Um, so as an adjunct to the other phenomena of air travel, I was taking pictures of these poor items that I was expected to eat and often was glad to eat because I was hungry, but which you, you kept wondering, can't they do better than this? <laughs> and I would actually sometimes go back and talk to the stewardesses about it and talk to them because, you know, they have to get the food together on the trays and so on. They weren't that happy about it either. Um, and then now that I tend to fly business class, um, it's really quite delicious to see the miniaturized little table with linen and all these things on it and all kinds of silverware all squeezed into a little space. And yes, I hear everyone whispering, hot nuts. Right. Yes, hot nuts. Um, uh, and it's just quite funny to look at we hated it when they served it to us, and we hated it more when they stopped serving it to us, because on <laughs> most flights, you have to bring food on board. So uh, again, it's, it's, it's another project that's supposed to make you laugh, because why not? Um, I wanted to show a slide of a piece that's not in the show. Uh -huh. um, of course, there's a lot that's not in the show because so much of your work is performance-based or it's event, event This one's based. a tour. It would be very it's hard a bus to put tour. it in the show. Yeah, so, but I wanted to talk about the bus tours a little bit and this one in particular. Okay, this one is Liverpool? Uh, Germany. No, it's Germany. Oh, yeah. this is Hamburg. Sorry. Um, yes. Well, I mean, it's um, in this case, you were looking at Jewish cemeteries, right? You were, you were on yes, you were doing and a bus tour, yes one was and destroyed no. and one was a shopping mall or something, and just well, wondered if you could talk a little sure. bit about that. Unfortunately, like a lot of my work, it's about more than one thing at a time. It's called, what is it called? A, an Empty Space in Ottenson, mm -hmm. contaminated, contaminated by History, history capital, capital and, and asbestos. asbestos. So, doing, doing, doing. Ottenson is a northern... Uh, most community in Hamburg, which is 
the place from which actually I think my father set sail for the US, which was a common thing, the Hamburg America Line, when he was 10. Um, it's a northern community in Germany and um, was very heavily bombed by Bomber Bob and the US in the summer of 1943. But that's not why I did a project there. I was invited to do a project there, so I'm actually gonna tell you at the risk of turning it into a shaggy dog story of why I was invited to do a bus tour in Hamburg. It was done by an architect and, no, a curator and an artist who's married to an architect. Uh, and it was, the, in the, it was from the early 90s when cities and uh, landscape, that is physical uh, space, were becoming a thing in the art world. And uh, because before that, people didn't actually make art about the idea of the city as a map or a plan. And I had done a show on housing, homelessness, and the built environment at DIA, in fact, three shows, and then was persuaded to do a work about what turned out to be about Greenpoint in the new museum. And they said, you must come over to Hamburg and do this. And I said, no, I'm busy, I can't do it. And they said, no, no, we, you must because it's about cities. So I thought, oh, okay. Um, my work in Greenpoint was partly about the intolerable uh, sewage treatment plant, which stank up the whole neighborhood and um, things like that. So I thought, oh, well, I'm gonna do a tour of the sewage treatment plants in Hamburg because I'm sure, you know, it'll be a revelation, German technology. And I mentioned this and they said, oh, that's great. We'll send you the book that they give out about the system for the tours. And I thought, wait, oh, it's Germany. Okay. What do I know about Germany? Several things that I won't repeat here, but there's a certain, yeah, plus technical knowledge. So um, I thought, okay, I have to do some serious research. And there was a, a photograph in the newspaper of a number of Hasidic Jews throwing themselves in front of um, riot police in Hamburg. So I said, what is this? And they said, oh yeah, um, they're trying to build another shopping center here and um, the Hasidim came over from Jerusalem, the Hevra Kadisha, and uh, said you can't move, you can't do anything here because we found Jewish bones. Uh, I thought, well, that's really interesting. So I did a, res a little research and discovered that those Hasidim were brought over by the Green Party who were against the shopping center and they thought, aha, we'll have Jews in front of German police and that'll stop this. Well, of course, it didn't stop it, but um, I did research on why they would be opposed to this and also on German Jewish cemeteries there and discovered that um, it was a Jewish community until the Nazis arrived. And there was, I'm sorry, I'm really having voice problems. There was an early Spanish Portuguese cemetery that was not desecrated by the Nazis because it was closed. So we visited it and read burial rules because it's a, you're not automatically granted the right to bury people if you're not Christian. So we read the rules, got back on the bus and went to Ottensen stood in front of this gigantic department store which was closed and covered with Turkish uh, banners of protest because it was now a Turkish community. And that was the one being torn down for an even bigger uh, shopping center. We walked around to the back where you could see um, bags of asbestos and also um, the parking lot had layers beneath it which were under which were the Jewish bones and so on, which the, the cemetery. So on the bus, I gave everybody a paragraph, which had been translated into German, to read about Jewish history and German history and real estate and what happens when a, a landscape is scarred by historical crime. And this was at the same time that the African burial site had been discovered in New York. There was a huge braha, mm -hmm. brouhaha about it, and the, it was a federal building was supposed to go over it. So, Nothing to see here, just a few bones. But in fact, it was a very large 
cemetery in which many former slaves had been buried, and it's actually, it was just vandalized a couple of days ago. So together we put together, so everyone got out of the bus and read a paragraph. We put together a narrative of what you have to think about in thinking about the creation and recreation of urban space and what happens when historical crimes have been committed on that site. So TMI perhaps, but that was the story. So Do we you want water. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's our okay. It's gonna stop. I know. If that helped me, I would ask everyone in the room to do it. <sighs> I'm going to flash forward because I want to make sure we have time to, um, I know this is painful, but I want to talk about I this piece before, because <laughs> I want, I think we should have time for questions, right? Yes. Yeah. So. I can um, talk forever. Yeah. <laughs> I should have warned I, you. I, know I, I knew I wouldn't have to do too That's much, uh, too much prep this time. <laughs> um, okay. It so. me a little bit. Sorry? I'm telling him his, his coughing helped me. Oh, okay, good. Um, so it's hard not to draw some connections between what's happening now and what was happening when you started your career with so much political upheaval. Um, I can barely manage to open the newspaper in the morning. Today was another case. Um, and I'm just wondering, this, this piece is, uh, closes the show. You exit, and it's uh, what greets you as you're making your, uh, your egress from, from the exhibition. And uh, it's a pretty powerful work, both in terms of its, uh, its imagery, but also its text. And I wonder if you could explain it to people who haven't had a chance to see it downstairs. It's called Point and Shoot, and it's a picture of your president, or not your president, the president, um, giving a speech in which he is talking, he's boasting about how, uh, how his voters are really solid, his support is solid, and he's comparing that to poor little uh, lion Ted Cruz and Rubio and all these people and how their support is soft, soft, soft. And in the middle of that, he says, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose a single voter, which many people noted because it was such a crude, gross, disgusting uh, thing to say. And yet there was no cost associated with that because he was right. Um, uh, I don't know about the shooting part, but that whatever he's gonna do, symbolic, action or not, was not going to lose him any votes. And um, so just after he was elected, I was asked by Art Forum to be one of a group of artists who made a work in response to the election of this guy. Normally, things have to grind on in my head for a while. I don't have like an instant reaction, but this one, I had an instant idea and I thought, the hell with this, I'm doing it. So I found that picture and I, um, made a digital uh, intervention in the image of him. It's a real photo. It's actually taken from a video um, in which uh, are embedded the names of people of color, primarily African Americans, who've been shot with impunity by police in the US uh, within just a couple of years with a few other names going back to the past, including Eleanor Bumper, so that's what it is. It's a name of uh, it's the names of people who have been shot without losing any, by people who have not lost any support of the population. Uh, and of course, I knew very well at the time, since this was not long after the death of Michael Brown and Ferguson, that of course, communities were mobilizing, are mobilizing, and will continue to mobilize, and yet that somehow didn't resonate in the same way that Trump's remark that there's this thing happening on the one side and then there's this thing on the other, the same way when um, Jamal Khashoggi is murdered, um, we are driven to distraction properly, but when other journalists have been murdered and other people continue to be murdered, somehow their death doesn't have the same resonance. So it's just a way of saying, let's look at a larger picture. 
Okay, and then lastly, I just wanted to put this image up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I You're so resist. mean. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, so much about your work going back to the early days deals with, you know, mass, mass distribution systems, be it through magazines or books or film. And now you've taken to the Internet and it's become a real outlet for you and your voice. And um, you've also adopted various uh, identities from... Um, Emma Gonzalez to uh, Christine Ford and Sandra Bland. So, how is how is your practice extending itself through this new technology, and what has this meant for you as a as a voice and um, as an artist? Uh, I never wanted to be on Facebook. I got put on Facebook by my former employer, university, and I was told by some Finnish women, there's a lot of junk on your page. I said, I don't have a page. <laughs> and then I saw them a year later in New York, and they said, there's a lot of junk on your page. You need to do something about this. So I looked, and I had a Facebook page. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? And somehow I wound up posting incessantly. You see, I'm able to talk a lot, and I have a lot of opinions, and sometimes... so. I used to run a list with some former students where I uploaded articles all the time. This is a common thing. There were closed email lists where you send each other articles. And lo and behold, Facebook is a premier site in which people whom I know exchange uh, articles. So when I'm busy working, my butt off late at night and I need to do something simple and direct and pertaining to the experience of our lives, I wind up doing it on Facebook. All right. Now it's your turn. No, well, I think, I think now's the turn to, uh, to, to turn it over to, yeah. our, to our audience and to take some questions. If, um, yeah, so we're going to walk around with the microphone. If anyone has a question, you can just raise your hand. I'll come find you. I forgot to bring my sunglasses. <laughs> oh, sorry, really is blinding. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's taking a picture of the crowd. Martha, uh, this is a, a, is this working? All right. Yes. Martha, this is a um, kind of an odd question, I think. You know, as, as long as I've at least seen you in the art field or at events, um, even like private meetings, uh, you've always had a camera uh, <laughs> with you. And you're, you constantly, <laughs> you're constantly taking pictures during meetings and during discussions. And, you know, it's not like you're using a phone. You're using, a, a, it looks like a little snap and shoot. Uh, 35 millimeter. Anyway, I always wonder when I see you, I, I, and I saw a picture, the picture that, of you in the Times, and you had the camera. And I'm just wondering, what happens with all those pictures? <laughs> and um, how many hundreds of thousands of pictures have you taken, and what are you planning on doing with them? Um, uh, taking lots of questions. them to my grave. No. Um, uh, first of all, I didn't bring my Lumix today or my Canon because I ran out of batteries and I thought the heck with it. Um, uh, yeah, I was persuaded to show a couple of carousels upon them, of, <laughs> can't speak today, uh, of them uh, once in a class at Columbia, which was not an art world class. Um, but I've, it's, do you know the work of Reiner Ganahl? We yes. had the same impulse, which is, so here we are, um, and what people will see is pictures of us or something on the wall. But this is actually an exchange in which many people are participating. And it's like in the Bowery where you see the background, not the foreground person. Um, the biggest lie about photography is that it's not a social interaction, but it is. And also, 
the phenomenon in our lives of seminars and lectures is so underreported in terms of it being a setting in which people participate and in which two unlucky people wind up sitting on a raised platform while the rest of you are in darkness or whatever. Um, I'm completely fascinated by this and by faculty meetings and uh, little board meetings and so on because um, it's like the airport. There are places that everyone knows about, everyone experiences, but very few people actually um, want to remember them in any substantive way. There are many such occasions, but I think we'd rather see a bedroom or a toilet scene than to see a picture <laughs> of people at a board meeting. But, but I, I like them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, right up here. My favorite work is the Bugle Boy and the prosthesis with a high heeled shoes. It's so um, Annoying. analogous. Did you find the Bugle Boy first or did you uh, create the prosthesis? How did that piece come about? I, so I'm just fascinated by it. These are two works called Prototype. One is called Prototype, Freedom is Not Free. The other is Prototype, God Bless America. Um, oh, how handy. Um, that's one of them. No tap, yeah. All right. The, so I live in Greenpoint, and Greenpoint used to be the village that time forgot. Um, uh, now it's not. Uh, so there was a, a Chinese import store on Manhattan Avenue, and um, uh, along with umbrellas and earmuffs and ladies' underpants, they sold a, a range of Chinese-made toys. This is, I guess, in 2005. And on the, ca the counter, along with a Godzilla figure, there was a little dancing dolls. You may have seen them uh, for Christmas where Santa dances. But this one was a soldier. And I was completely fascinated and repelled, but it was $17. And I thought, why would I be spending $17 on this? And I went away and I came back and I looked at it and I went away. Finally, a day later, I thought, oh my God, what if it's gone? I went back and I bought it. <laughs> and, and I don't remember if the prosthetic leg was made in re before or after or in relation. But I often, a lot of my work depends on what I've called the decoy, things that look like one thing but really are just dead objects that remind you of something alive. And I use burlesque uh, so, and uh, various ways of making fun of things because I'm Jewish. And um, this kind of vaudevillian humor and wearing silly costumes and making large, um, blow-ups of things or soft uh, versions of things or little versions of things, things that change scale in order to say, look, it's different from what you think. Um, and with the prosthetic leg, it's a woman's prosthetic leg, which is why there are Gucci sandals uh, uh, stenciled on it at the top. Um, I. The, the dancing doll has his leg rolled up, and you can see that his knee actually is a prosthetic knee, of course, because he's plastic with, you know, a joint. The, but, of course, what I'm talking about is not funny, and it's not intended to be funny. It's that the signature injury of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the only one we knew about at the time was traumatic amputation of limbs because our soldiers had unarmored vehicles and they were riding over uh, improvised uh, roadside bombs and they were having their legs blown off. It turns out that also traumatic brain injury is also one of the two signature injuries. So this was an effort to say both in small and in large, you need to think about this. Hi, um, I'm fascinated by your journey from being a painter <laughs> and um, then doing this work, which is so provocative and has so much meaning to it. 
so, so many layers to it. I wonder though, as a painter, do you still want to paint? Funny you should ask, no. <laughs> I thought, how can I give this up? I love it so much. Eh. <laughs> I got busy with other things. Um, seriously, uh, I love doing it partly because of the discipline of focus and of a certain kind of quiet, right, and just me and the abstract painting on a very large canvas. Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any last questions? So th this might be incredibly trivial and uh, not interesting, or it might be really interesting, but one thing that struck me in looking at these slides was um, the variety of fonts or typefaces that you use in your work. So starting with the Bowery, which has actually, I think, two different typewriter fonts. Again, this is, this is just, anyway. Um, and then- You the, wrote that label. <laughs> <laughs> this is no, our No, I didn't curator. actually, I didn't. Uh, but but I, then at looking at the Trump piece, which actually also has, you know, a font choice that, that struck me as, as quite unusual. I um, mean, you, you just use the word burlesque to describe kind of the mode that some of your work is in. I've also heard you use the word ham-fisted. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious if you could talk a little Cr bit about... Crude's another word. Sure, yeah, okay. Um, so if, if you could talk a little bit about how... Um, you, you could take it in one direction, either to talk about how, how you make selections for different fonts or typefaces that you use in your work, or perhaps to, to think about how um, you know, that crudeness or that burlesque is strategically deployed in these different, in these different ways. But I think you just explained it. No, I'm, ser I'm serious. I mean, obviously... So I did not get an MFA. I, I did get an MFA. I didn't get a BFA. I got a BA. I was a lit major. I spent a lot of time with my, a lot of time with my nose buried in a book. And one of the things that fascinated me was, um, I remember this is like my freshman year in college, actually. They gave us a book of readings, and each story was in a different typeface. And I th was thinking how different that made each of them feel and why did they do that? Because every other book I'd ever read in my short life was a uniform typeface. They chose a font. and uh, So I got very interested in questions of typography and I also studied calligraphy. This is more than you ever wanted to know. Um, um, so. Again, not to mention it too many times, I'm Jewish. We are people of the book. This has been a major factor in my life, the text-based, word-based culture in which you look at the text and you look at the shape of the letters. And especially in Hebrew, there are marks that tell you for cantillation how to sing them, how to put them together. So I see this as being, um, there's a reason why so much thought and energy has been expended in the history of writing on what the text looks like. So I um, understand that there are texts that are, especially uh, online now, texts that are um, identified with various eras and so on, which worries me because I don't have the time to think about that really. But I do make a choice based on what it calls up in what, where I've seen it before and also just aesthetically what, and by aesthetically I don't mean beautiful, I mean in terms of what I think it conveys. Was there another part? Uh, no, I'm serious. I, I, I thought there were actually two questions in your question. I guess the, the second part of the question, if, if there is one, is really about, again, like how, how you see that ham-fistedness, that crudeness operating in your work, um, and you know, kind of in tension with perhaps this highly crafted and you know, intentional and um, you know, not aesthetic, but you know, you're producing an artwork that, that satisfies certain conditions as an artwork. Uh, I, 
I'm often on two sides of a question, both utopian and anti-utopian, both anti-aesthetic and aesthetic. And I'm always trying to deny that I have any formal concern. And yet, if people suggest I don't have any formal concern, I become indignant. Uh, because, of course I do. I'm often just dealing with a, f and you can't be an abstract painter if you're not thinking about the field of production. That's what absolutely consumed me as a painter. How do you, what do you do with the edge? How do you deal with the edge? And so I was, oh, you don't want to hear this. I'm going to stop talking about it because I can talk <laughs> about painting and the edge far longer than you want to hear it. But it became really crucial at a certain moment to say aesthetics is the last thing we're concerned with. And I kind of referred to that when I was talking about the reception of the anti-war photo montages and how they've been essentially aestheticized. So the Bowery, so of course they were treated as ugly at the time. The problem with getting old is that you see that things that were despised become celebrated. When a certain critic looked at the Bowery pictures, he said, but they're so ugly and banal. I said, right. <laughs> and now people say, oh, they're so beautiful. What? No, they're not. They're ugly. Uh, they're quotations of a type. So you, you try to move the conversation to things that are more familiar to people or that are reminiscent of traditions rather than of your genius or your cleverness. I mean, mine, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> yours is good. OK, maybe we'll take one more question. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, you mentioned earlier that you once thought that you and your friends would revolutionize the art scene. And I would say that you did. Um, in art school, when we started with collage, we started with you, with aesthetics and, and underlying meanings and subtleties and politics. It, we started with you. Which, <laughs> so it's an honor to meet you tonight. Um, thank you. In relationship to some of your earliest works, such as um, Bringing the War Home, and then your most recent works with um, Point and Shoot. Um, I feel like a lot of people who attend your gallery shows are familiar with your art. Um, you know, we all kind of lean left. We have college educations, so I feel like we can get it. It's a little bit more accessible to us. Um, what would be your advice for young artists who want to um, ensure that their work resonates with even conservatives and Trump supporters to perhaps <laughs> shift their ways of seeing and ways of thinking. Because um, I feel like art can be revolutionary, um, but I, I'm, I'm so afraid that right now it's only revolutionary in certain circles. And um, while I don't want to make art for conservatives, I still feel like I, we, yeah, I feel like I should, you know, I feel like artists can use their power to do that. So what would be um, your advice on that? So I love this question, but the answer is long. I'll try to be really brief. Um, it, you're not making work for conservatives. You're making the work you want to make. Um, I don't think you can project into people's minds and try and fathom what people are thinking. You just have to make what, what you want to make. Um, and I would suggest that you make work more for your friends than people whom you perceive to be your other and hope to expand outward. I was going to say something in another register, though. So the anti-war photo montages um, this, the group relating to Iraq and Afghanistan, I have to say, when I was in the photo lab printing them and when they were on the wall in various museums, because this set, unlike the Vietnam set, were in museums immediately, guards came up to me. The people in the photo lab uh, said, these need to be really big. You need to put them everywhere. And the guards in the museum came up to me to talk about these works. These works are accessible on a visceral level. That's what they were always intended to be. There's no, 
there may, well, there are always levels at which you can say, um, I'm sorry you don't see that this is a feminist work, for example, about some of them. But I think people understand what they're about and can take it from there. It doesn't need a text to explain it to them. I think if you are interested in making work that speaks to people, as I said, start with talking, as I did, to people who think like me and hope that what you have to say holds up in other people's eyes. The other thing I'd say now is these are really difficult times. Uh, more difficult, perhaps, than we might want to admit. But, you know, people have been yelling for a long time that people are siloed and they only hear from their own groups. It's very hard to get past that. So um, uh, I worry about that more than about anything. On the other hand, I actually believe you have to choose a side. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I think that's it. We'll be here Thank for the you. next few minutes if anyone wants to come up and meet Martha.